Hi everyone and thanks for having me this morning. Um, today I'm going to talk about a unit that I run at Deakin University which is the School of Psychology's largest unit. It runs all three trimesters and we have over 2,000 students who enrol in this unit over the year. In the trimester that just started this morning at 9am um, we have about 1400 students enrol but we can last year we had 1550 in the semester so it's a really large semester um, and cohort it's blended and online so we have about 350 students who are online only we're across four different campuses including our Curie education campus and some learning hubs um, 43 different courses take this subject so the academic preparedness is really varied some some people are studying to be teachers some nurses some have ATARs of 90 plus some have ATARs of 50 uh, and we typically hire somewhere between 25 and 30 sessional staff for marking and teaching so it's a really challenging unit and often in units that size um, it's challenging to really uh, personalize the learning experience for the student and to connect with them and for them to have a good experience. However, in this unit we've been able to consistently over time manage to get exceptionally high student evaluations. I've only got the la last two large semesters, so this was 2016 we had 1505 and 2015 we had 1558 in this trimester too. And you can see on all the questions we consistently score 94% or above that students agree or strongly agree so that they're satisfied with the teaching, um, they think the workload's appropriate, that the feedback really helps them with their learning, that the learning resources are also um, helping them achieve the learning outcomes that they have set for themselves. So today what I wanted to do was just talk to you very briefly in 15 minutes about three of the practices that we've put into this unit and then um, that we've used to kind of personalise the learning for students, how we've leveraged technology to do that and how we've really tried to create a teacher pre presence because one thing that happens I guess with such a large unit spread out over so many campuses is it's really challenging for me to connect with all of those students um, and even have the workload and time to be able to do that. So I want to talk about three different things very quickly and how we've actually then um, translated those to other units outside of my own. So the first one um, that I wanted to talk to you about was giving audio feedback. So what we did with the students assessment, originally we had three different um, journals that they submit uh, throughout the semester and we wanted to make it a little bit more personalised. What was happening, a lot of the sessional um, markers were making up cheat sheets and copying and pasting the same responses um, onto students' work, which I don't blame them for doing when you've got a lot of students, that's kind of sometimes you need to do things like that, but it's not really personalised to that student. So we got rid of all written comments, we just had a rubric and each marker recorded five minutes of audio feedback for the student about their work. And we literally trained the marker to talk to the student as if the student was right there in front of them, um, going through their work and saying what they could have done better, uh, what they could do next time to improve, and also some tips and hints along the way. Importantly, what we found about giving audio feedback was that it takes less time once you get used to doing it, but also they gave a lot more detail. What you can say in five minutes is so much more than what you can say um, if you're going to write it all out. And certainly when you're writing out comments on, and you only have five minutes to do it, it's a little bit more blunt. You wouldn't kind of put all the nice um, frilly bits around it. And with audio feedback, the tone of your voice and the intonation and all of that provides an extra layer to the student. So that means that even though you might be giving critical feedback to the student, they can hear in your voice that you really wanted them to do well and that you could see that they were trying and all of that comes out to the student and they can see that you're, you care about the piece of work that they've done. So once we had kind of done audio feedback for some time, we started doing this in 2011 every semester, so I think we're up to 16 semesters of giving audio feedback on the student's work. Um, once I got that down pat and worked out how to get 25 different sessional markers to give the same high quality feedback across all of the students on different campuses, we started working on this idea of feed forward feedback. So we started teaching our, trainer, uh, teaching our markers how to actually connect the pieces of work together. So instead of them just talking about the piece of work that the students submitted, they actually had to link that piece of work to the future piece of work that the student was going to do. We did this by mapping out our three assessments and working out where the skills, uh, the skill sets that the student would be using uh, overlapped 
and where we were building on skills that they'd already done. So even though they weren't resubmitting the same piece of work, they're submitting a different piece of work, the markers actually give them feed forward feedback where they're actually saying, okay, see what you did, this, did on this piece of work here? In the next piece of work that's due in one week's time, this question three is really similar. And this is how you're going to use what you did here to improve or do better the next time. Uh, and this probably is one of the best things that we ever did because anyone who does a lot of marking will know lots of students open their piece of work, look at just the grade and then um, shut it and don't read any comments. And I think that's truly because they don't see how it is going to be meaningful, the, meaningful for them in the future. We give this feedback a week before the student um, submits their next piece of work. It's really timely. They've started working on that piece of work so they get the feedback, they can see how it's meaningful and how they can translate it. So last semester we gave about four and a half thousand audio files in an 11 week semester. So big, there's a lot going on with 25 different markers, but despite that we're actually able to maintain really high student satisfaction with our feedback. So on our student evaluations for feedback on my work in this unit helps me to achieve the learning outcomes. You can see in the last semester we had 94% of students agreed or strongly agreed that it did. Even though we made, did 4,500 assignments, they were really happy. And the circles here are just to show the semesters where we have 1,500 students in them. The other thing I just wanted to show you also is how this has progressed over time. And I know at the back you probably won't be able to see this, but when we first started doing it, um, in 2011, we were able to jump our student satisfaction up from 79% to 87% and maintain that over time just through the introduction of audio feedback. In 2014, we introduced the feed forward feedback. And again, you can see a jump from the, eight, the 80s into the 90s. And again, we're maintaining that over time. So I think that shows that, you know, not only did the audio feedback help students, but then introducing this feed forward feedback was also something that they thought was really useful for them. Okay, the second practice is um, connecting with students. I think one of, uh, on my workload, I don't know what it is, but something like I get allocated four minutes per student for my whole workload for the semester, right? Impossible to actually have meaningful time with any student when it's like that. So we came up with this way of connecting with students through automated emails and automated SMS so I could connect with a student with a really low workload. So. The first one is that we use a tool called Intelligent Agents, which searches for student behaviour on the LMS. Uh, so submitting assignment, not submitting assignment, logging on, not logging on to the LMS. It looks for it, we tell it when to look, and then it sends an automated email out. And I, uh, I've got five triggers up here. This is one that, uh, that we use in multiple units. In my actual unit, I have about 22 of these different emails set up. So these emails are targeting things like they're an off-campus student. So specifically looking for that type of student and sending those students a particular thing. They're part time or um, yeah, they might have got a good, um, a good grade on a, a, an assignment. So we do and then um, after doing it in my own unit, we actually started doing it now in five other first year psychology units. So now students, if they haven't logged on in 12 days, they get an automated email from their unit chair saying, hey, I noticed you haven't logged on. Um, you know, these are all the things going on in our unit, it's really important if you need any help, here's a list of resources with all the links, we have a doctor on campus, we have this, if you need an extension request, this is the link. So some of my favourite things, um, you know, because often in retention programs we just look at the at-risk students, so one of the things that we've really tried to do is also incorporate students who have got high marks, so we, they get an email if they get above 80%. But also, um, we track students' progress over time. There's this big band of students, I think, that are trying their absolute best, but their absolute best might still only be 65%, right? They're trying really hard. That might be, you know, as good as they can get, or certainly perhaps they might not be hitting that 80% mark. So we started sending out emails, and this is kind of what an email would look like that we might send out. We started sending emails out to students that we saw improved over time. So if they got a 60 on one assignment and then a 65 on the next assignment, they get one of these emails from me saying, hey, I noticed that you did better this time. And you can see here it's personalised, like their name goes into the email, we use verbal persuasion and we always have an expectation that the student can succeed, even if we're sending them an email to say, oh, 
did you, you might not have got a good mark, as good a mark as you want. We always expect to have that kind of tone that it's not over, we can help you still like reconnect with us. You can see here, um, we have things like elephant stamps on our emails that we send out. And this is really my personality coming out. I had this great memory of being in primary school when you did a piece of work and you know someone gave you an elephant stamp or a smiley stamp and I thought I wanted to replicate that in the online environment. And I thought it could either go two ways, they're gonna think I'm super lame or they're gonna really like it and have the same memory. And uh, I think I got somewhere in between. <laughs> they certainly like it and they, prob they certainly do think I'm pretty lame, but I'm okay with that. So we send these out and we get things, um, emails and posts on our Facebook group that kind of says like, oh, you know, I had this great memory of getting this stamp or I wanted to do well in the next quiz just to see what the next stamp was. So, that, you know, that's really lovely. I know they're doing a quiz because they want the stamp, but it's still winning to me, right? Like that's still winning even if they're not doing it to learn. Because um, some students, of course, the ones most at risk are not opening their institutional emails, uh, I thought I'm not letting these people get away. So I started sending out automated text messages to students. And we do this across all the first year units in psychology as well now. Yep. Um, so there's three main triggers that we use. Sometimes we have other ones, but it's, they haven't logged onto Cloud Deacon, our LMS, uh, before census date. So that means they've had about four weeks and they still have never logged on. We send them a text message saying, hey, do you know you're enrolled in this unit and what can we do to help you? It's amazing how many students reply to that one and say, oh, I'm not enrolled in your unit. And you're like, oh, yes, you are. And you're about to pay like yes. tomorrow. So <laughs> hop on Student Connect and uh, sort it out. We send um, SMSs to students if they haven't submitted their assignment. So literally about two hours after the Dropbox closes, I will send out a bulk SMS to everyone who hasn't submitted, just saying like, did you know your assignment was due today? Uh, and then that can again start a dialogue with them. And we also send out a congratulations for really high marks. This is my favorite. In a semester when you've got 1500 assignments, we will text and say, you scored one of the top 10 grades from 1500 grades or however many people there are. And that's so lovely. We get so many nice responses from that. So we um, asked the students what they thought and 89% um, of them agreed or strongly agreed that it motivated them to do well in the next assessment piece or log on to the LMS more often. Um, and 96% agreed or strongly agreed that they thought it, that the unit, it showed that the unit team cared about how they were progressing. And the last thing that I wanted to show you is um, live chat. So this is that um, pop-up widget you get when you're online shopping, when the person says, can I help you? That is literally me. I'm like, can I help you? This is kind of what our live chat looks like. Yep, it's a bit lame. We've got our heads on it. It pops up at the bottom of um, our LMS homepage for my unit. Um, if I'm available, it's there and they see this picture here. There's three of us who um, monitor it. If we're not there, it's completely disappears and they can't click on it. But what it means is we can interact with them live, chat with them online in the same way that they would kind of chat with their friends. It's literally like sending a text message, I guess. Um, the great thing about this is that even though it, it does sort of increase your workload, because obviously you've got to spend time chatting with the students, it decreased it in so many ways because they stopped um, emailing us as often and posting and doing other things that were also taking up a lot of time. In fact, emails take up more time than the live chat does. So just to give you an example, in my unit, um, we tracked how many, in one semester I did 315 chats with students and I tracked when they were chatting with me. And those black lines there that you can see is when their assignment is due. So I'm actually sitting here, see these blank spaces, I'm sitting here, I'm available, they see that the live chat is there and they are choosing not to, ch to talk to me and I think that costs me nothing, right, to sit there and no one talk to me, it just is on the background of my computer while I'm working, but they can see I'm available and I'm present for them and they get to choose whether they want to talk to me or not. And when we have actually surveyed the students, um, and ask them about what they think about it, we can see that over and over again, they're just like, we want to use live chat for assessment. And certainly when I talk to them online, they all they ask me are questions about their assignment. It's clear they're sitting there with their assignment open, they're working on it, they have questions about their assignment. They're not asking me necessary, like questions like, where's this PDF or how do I get to this class? They're working on their assignment. So it's really useful. And 
They, uh, they use it because it's quick, fast, immediate, convenient. Um, when we ask them, like, do you still use discussion boards? What do you use? Why would you use that? Overwhelmingly, they've been saying, oh, anytime the question would be useful for somebody else, happy to post it on the discussion boards. Anytime that I don't need an immediate answer, like it's not time urgent, post it on the discussion boards. So that was nice to know that they weren't just using it just willy-nilly. And we've also asked them, um, uh, would they recommend it to other people? 95% agreed or strongly agreed. Were they satisfied? 97% said they were strongly satisfied or above. Live chat made me feel like the unit team cared. 92% agreed or strongly agreed. And live chat was useful to give me just-in-time support. 95% agreed. Um, so we're actually just collecting this data right now. I haven't cleaned it. I just took it off Qualtrics to put into this slide. Um, we're right in the middle of surveying the students. So we started off in my unit um, in last year and this, this time last year, just one person, one unit. In um, the summer semester, we have done three online units that had it. And now in the trimester that's just finished, we had it in four first year psychology units, one third year psychology unit, two first year engineering units, one medicine postgraduate unit to kind of see whether the students had the same experience of it. And so far, I think it's going really well. We've expanded even further this trimester that's about to start. Over the summer trimester, because um, th th we haven't got the data from the one just gone, for the three units that were online, we were able to reduce the number of people who dropped out on average across the three units by 7.5%. So these are people who have just not engaged with the unit, they've paid for it, but not submitting any assessment. We were able to reduce that by 7.5% on average. Uh, but on top of that, so more people were submitting work, less people were also failing. So we were able to reduce it by 2.5% number of fails. So for us, that's a really big win. Um, even though we weren't, didn't really know what we were doing and we were just kind of trying to work out what would work best for the students. So that's why we keep to continue to expanding it. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs>
Queens, I'm not just adding up the states, Queensland, New South Wales, ACT, Victoria. Um, so four states, so those different jurisdictional boundaries have different challenges associated with them. Um, we teach in 14 health disciplines across that faculty. So they're really, and you know, some of those disciplines will teach in on all six campuses, others might be two. So it really is quite a diverse uh, faculty. Um, just going back into the retention stuff. So what our objective in this project was really just to promote the teaching practices that promote retention. So we see retention as a whole of university business the stuff around student life and making the campus a nice place to be and being close to bars and coffee shops and all of that sort of stuff is part of the big package and we know that influences choice um, in terms of where students go. The focus of this project was on the practices within the classroom. So the things that we could do as teachers in a classroom, whether it's a face-to-face -face or a virtual environment to promote students feeling valued, included and therefore increase the likelihood of retention. We're lucky in um, health sciences because of the fact that many of those courses are linked strongly to vocational outcomes. So things like paramedicine, nursing, midwifery, there are spe very specific kind of perceptions of where the students want to go. Um, in some health disciplines that's not so clear so things like exercise science psychology because there's not that clear link to to outcomes in I'm going to get a job that's where the retention issues kind of show up okay so in general we're quite you know we're doing well in in terms of retention because of that vocational link uh, but there are some areas in which we could do better. And this was aiming at improving everything and in specifically in the, the kind of less vocationally um, focused areas like exercise science. Um, so the, the whole of university approach is about the, you know, the, the student experience in life, the support services in academic area. We have something called Leap Into Learning at ACU, which is just take, you know, teaching students how to do essays and use the library and all that kind of academic skills stuff. Um, at a faculty school level, it's about having good curriculum. Um, and here is, is where we focus the projects that I'm about to talk about. It's about classroom practice. Um, the principles of retention, so this uh, model of uh, transition pedagogy that I'm about to speak about, it kind of came out of first year because of course that's where we leak the most. Students get to a certain point and they might think, oh, I didn't know being a paramedic you had to see blood and they leave. <laughs> um, all that sort of stuff. But, so it, it kind of got framed around first year, but it is a whole of life at university issue. And there are different flashpoints. So the main, main one, as I said, is first year. Um, there's flashpoints around professional experiences. So when it comes to going on your first nursing placement, it might be a bit overwhelming and that's the point in which you decide to withdraw from your program because actually doing it is a bit scary. So that's another little flashpoint. Um, and of course, assessments, you know, that, that might promote enough anxiety that you bail at that point in time. So this is the retention framework. So this is kind of what we use to frame the uh, resources that we develop for the academic staff in helping them to understand what they do as teachers uh, and to give them some language around that to, to enable them to communicate to others um, what they're doing. So, so this KIFT framework is, um, whilst it's called transition pedagogy, it has six elements. The first one is transition. So it's about curriculum design that we need to recognise that our students are always in a state of being on a journey. I hate that word, but it's the best one I can think of to describe this. They're always in a state of change and moving from one area to another. So first year, they're getting used to the place, you know, they're all the, making friends, all of that kind of stuff um, is the, the main kinds of challenges. Second year, they're there's other things that they're concerned with, probably getting more of the theoretical stuff consolidated, maybe going on some professional practice experiences and that kind of thing. And third year, they're getting ready to get out of there. 
Okay, so learning all the how to get a job stuff as well as consolidating um, some of their learning. Um, the second element there is that we need to uh, recognise that students are diverse, that they bring in with them a whole set of skills um, and a, a whole lot of um, strengths and weaknesses and that they are individuals that respond to different things. That can be particularly challenging when you're talking about groups like 1,500 students, how you recognise those diversity, um, the individuality of each student can be really challenging. Um, the, we need to design effective curriculum, so we need to make explicit what we're doing um, and why, why students learn particular things. So we've just done um, something at ACU, changing all our um, templates and inform our units, so that structure our units that um, require us to say, this is why this unit's important. This is why we've chosen this teaching strategy and this is why you're being assessed that in a particular way. So that's crystal clear to the students and they understand what they're doing. Um, promoting engagement, so embedding active and interactive experiences for the students. Um, assessing them regularly and making that assessment meaningful um, because I think most of us get uh, most of our kind of queries when students don't understand why they're doing an assessment, what the, the purpose is, and, and that can be confusing for them. Um, and evaluation and monitoring is about similar things to what Jaslyn was talking about. Um, giving, making students uh, aware that you're, you know what's going on, that you're aware of them. We, we are watching you kind of stuff. And that has a sense of them. Uh, promotes a sense of them being valued. Um, within ACU, we've got a t what we call it as the ZAR task force, which is a it's a, a body of, that looks at um, how we can promote students staying with us, and that funded um, this project. Um, so where this project came from in 2015. There were specific strategies that were implemented in a number of disciplines um, aimed at retaining students. Five minutes, okay, a bit of motor. Um, and this 2016 project was an evaluation of those strategies um, and this is what we came up with. So this is really important because this really, to me, <laughs> says uh, what was happening. We. My role was to interview a number of academic staff who were, you know, who were implementing a certain strategy that was aimed at retaining students within that framework that we just talked about, um, and some other academic staff. And the most interesting part of it was that people were doing stuff, but they weren't aware that it was actually transition pedagogy. So, you know, they weren't aware that they were cats and they were doing really cool stuff. So making that, um, recognising that and giving people the language um, made them feel really good and it also uh, encouraged them to share their practices with others. So a couple of the, the, the two main challenges that we had was that people didn't have a language around this, they didn't know what to call it. And there was no means of them sharing with one another the practices that they were, they were using. Some people were doing amazing, amazing, amazing stuff, but there was no way anybody would be aware of what they were doing unless we went and spoke to them. So some of the, the staff that were dealing, say, with international students, who had been international students themselves, had an amazing kind of ability to empathise with that student's situation and were going, you know, to amazing lengths to accommodate them and, and make them feel included and all of that sort of stuff. We wouldn't have known about that unless we, we went through this process of interviewing them. Um, and there were a whole lot of uh, practices around assessment um, that were also pretty... Uh, you know, pretty remarkable, but weren't um, weren't obvious to others unless unless we went through this process of interviewing. So our mission was to kind of develop some exemplars to facilitate a bit of sharing of good practice. 
Um, we kind of st started off having this vision that we would have an exemplar like that incorporated all those six elements. But what we found was that that was kind of impossible, that we could f find some people that were doing exemplary things around diversity and others that were doing exemplary things around assessment and that they really picked up on one of those elements. And we also wanted to give staff uh, a way of seeing those in that kind of snapshot way um, that didn't take up too much time. So we just put together a little template and a pretty straightforward process of this is what this person's doing, blah, 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 blah. Um, the, this um, learning management system site we set up so staff could self-enrol um, and that we were promoting that through the Faculty of Health Science with emails and word of mouth and all that kind of stuff. Um, so it's just basically a resource that get, takes out snippets of that theoretical framework that I, I referred to before, the Sally Kiff stuff. And in each tile area, so there's some examples of the practices of the academic staff in a little PDF form that they can download as a little clever guide. Okay. Um, it would be nicer if I could show you, but... Okay, that might be an idea, yeah, yeah. Um, and that was the end, should that have worked. Um, just acknowledgements of our, our team members, um, because this wasn't just me, this was a number of people across a number of campuses. And questions? Thanks very much and um, good morning everyone. Yeah, look, my name is John Schwartz and um, I'm the convener of the um, Academic Advisors Group and um, that's me. And um, yeah, you've just heard that this has been going on basically since about 2011, the group that we've been developing. And I guess I started this off um, back with my now boss, Glenn Bates, um, as um, when we were in the old faculty. We've been, there's been so many restructures, I can't tell you how many, but we're, we're now who we are. <laughs> so look, um, Student Development Advisors came up as an idea back then and it was really because of what you've all basically been hearing about and which uh, I suppose is so much in the news. Uh, actually this time last week I was in Adelaide for my fourth STARS conference thing and you, you just get this sense when you go to these conferences year in year out that all universities basically know what the issues are and they're all dealing with them in kind of similar ways, there's variations within. There's nothing particularly new in anything I'm going to tell you today I'm sure but Basically, when we started recognising this at Swinburne, we thought, look, it's actually time to do something. It was about the high attrition, right? It was about our problems with retention, and it's been well publicised, the figures, the numbers that Swinburne has had. Um, I'm actually just dealing with the Hawthorne campus, but I do actually deal with online students, OUA students and whatever, but I'm basically going to be talking about what we do in Hawthorne for this uh, particular talk. So I was the first, now there are six of us, and there's talk that maybe with some funding we might get up to nine in the three faculties that we... We basically, so nine across the university, three per faculty, hopefully at the moment we've got six. Basically, as you can see on the dot points here, it's really basic and straightforward what our job was with, with a, you know, a group teamwork effort. We're trying to really help students from, from the get-go, from when they first enrol, um, their first the orientation program right through to, to the end. And uh, helping them in any way possible through all these difficulties that clearly so many students want to high percentage of students are really struggling to deal with. We're trying to do our best to help them. Um, there's seven things I'm going to try and get through in 15 minutes. Not sure how I'm going to do it, but I'll, I'll do my best. So the first thing, soon after enrolment, is um, what we used to call boot camp. And boot camp um, was a five-day intensive program for all newly enrolled students. That's how it started, with newly enrolled students. In the first two or three years, we called it boot camp. We got rid of that name when some of the students thought that they couldn't come to it because we're going to go to the hills and give them a really hard time. But um, it's actually done very nicely in the university environment with free lunches providing all the rest of it. So we changed it to Strategies for Success. There's our marketing group that came up with that. And as you can see from the dot points, I'm not going to go through all of them. This is, this is the kind of stuff we do over five days. So it's the week before orientation and they're all invited. Every new student who's coming to the university is invited. And the last two or three years, we've also invited students who have been at risk to show cause 
the unsatisfactory progress students, they're also invited to come. So we have really large numbers. It started with maybe three, four hundred. We've now got over 1,500 students who come to these things. Obviously, the February one is much bigger than the one we're having next week, uh, which is the mid-year intake one. But essentially, we've now got 30, maybe 40 percent of all newly enrolled students coming to these this program, and we do it twice a year, obviously. And over the five days, and you can read the dot points better than I can read them to you, over the five days, that's what we're basically trying to cover. It's intensive, and together with our colleagues, and we have a lot of people from the other support groups coming in, and the LAS, the Learning and Academic Skills Group, come in and help us do all these sort of things. We're really trying to cover a lot of ground. And this is the basic idea that they get this transition process understood about this is what we do at university, this is what it takes to be a good university student. That's essentially what it's about. And we go through, obviously, lots of details over the five days with all the, the experts that we can find in the field and basically we hope that they get a lot out of it. Now, as a result of these, I mean, we've always done student evaluations and, you know, I, I have certain ideas about how important and valuable student evaluations are. So. What we start to do is actually go to the analytics team and all the people who are really good at doing this sort of, sort of data and actually trying to work out, well, what happens in that semester, in the next semester and whatever. So we've got some figures, and this is the latest ones that I've got in front of you. We've got like the idea of the success rate. That means the number of units that they passed as a percentage of the units that they were enrolled in in the first semester. And you don't know the thing about FBL, that's the, the business faculty. F had that's faculty I work with, health, arts, design. And F said is the engineering, science, technology group. And those who attended Strategies for Success, who did attend, and we, we looked at their marks you know, six months later, they got those, th that was the percentage pass marks that they received. But you can basically see that the ones who did not attend were far more, <laughs> in a sense, reflective of Swinburne. And in fact, um, you know, the, the figure is basically saying 20% of students, basically, roughly, you know, failed ongoing units. This is just students at Hawthorne. You saw the press and all the unfavourable publicity we got last year at Swinburne that when you take online students who don't come to this or OUA students, the figure at Swinburne got closer to 30%, but that's another story. But you can clearly see that there's, there's obviously some, some difference in terms of the success rates, in terms of the units that they pass. And in terms of the actual marks, they actually looked at every you know, student for their four units, whatever that they were doing, what were their marks, and you can see the average figures uh, that when they came to all the students who attended versus those who did not attend. I've got to tell you, as a non-stats type of person, when I first saw these, I thought, oh, it's not much different. I didn't think it was a substantial increase. But my boss, who's very good at stats and psychology, says, that, John, he said, John, that is statistically significant. That's really <laughs> important. So that's what he says. Whatever. So um, look, that's what, we, that's what we get, and that's what we, and, and you know, for funding and to tell people what we do and all this, that, Glenn says I've got to talk a lot about that. So that's the sort of stuff that we, we got. So that's strategies for success and um, it's grown. As I said, we've got larger numbers now enrolled and doing it on a regular basis and we'll be doing it um, this time next week here. The second thing we do, and to be quick about this one, did this about four years ago. It was before census date, it's a really important time. We've got the figures and whatever. It was this idea that we really do have a lot of students who really need to make some informed decisions about where they're at and what they're doing. And so because Census Day is coming out, we get each of the um, lecturers and the choose. We try to do this in-house as much as possible. It's online and we do lots of uh, things to tell students about this sort of stuff. But the, we're getting the lecturers, the people in the classroom and the tutors to basically go through in five, ten minutes in week three, which we call Reflection Week and always had this sort of thing where got this image of Rodin, the thinker, you know, sort of thinking, this is really time to have an important reflection. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah, it's, I know, we've got some problems. But um, we, we got this sort of thing where we really want them to have a think about what's happening for the rest of the semester. Obviously, to teach, especially first year students, if they, in fact, are finding it really hard and they can't cope for all the reasons we've spoken about before, if they can't cope to maybe think about going from four units to three units or three units to two units or whatever, and therefore not failing and not having to pay fees, etc. So it's a really important time to review and then talk and discuss, and they're told all these people that they can talk and discuss these issues with, which includes my team and everyone else that's involved. Um, so they're really given a kind of a, after, this, after the orientation program, the first three weeks, okay, then the fourth week, it's census time. So it's a really important time, and we've found it really effective again in getting more students involved in saying, well, where am I at and what am I doing? So that's the second thing. 
Now this is the thing that takes me the longest and biggest part of my life and whatever. It's almost a 50 week a year job, this sort of stuff. So it's the one on one 30 minute appointment thing. And this is the stuff where um, my team basically looking throughout the, our own faculties, what's going on. And where do we get this information from about the students we need to see and who we contact or who contact us? It's really the first three dots there. And the first one, I've got to say, really good cooperation with um, the faculties in terms of getting information about who is at risk, who is show cause in, from the last semester. So I just got this last week for the semester just finished. And you know, I've got to tell you that uh, the at risk students in, in my faculty, it went from you know, 560 something to over 740 in this last period of time. So that's how many students just are at risk in my faculty. The other faculties, oh no, um, <laughs> is, are, really, um, are really you know, in the same sort of category. And we are seeing these students all the time. We record each student we see and we mark down what are the reasons, what, what are they talking about, what are their problems, are the academic issues, the health issues, the mental health issues, I can't tell you how difficult that has been over the last few years. I can see the numbers going up. We record all that sort of thing. We tick the boxes, whatever. The financial issues, working for 30 hours at McDonald's, all that kind of stuff that they're not really able to cope with the low that they're on. And so we basically are looking at these things and then we refer them on. We get referrals from others, but the amount of distance that goes from out my, my office to the, you know, the careers office, to the, especially to the health office with the psychologists, the psychiatrists, the counsellors who work there, the doctors. Um, we are constantly sending students over there. The LAS group who are teaching students how to write properly and you know, use sentences. All, all that kind of stuff. We see so many students. We see so many of them all the time. And I'm talking about, you know, looking at really, I mean, at the moment, you know, I've seen you know, over 600 students this semester so far in these half hour interviews. It's, a, it's incredible. They just keep coming in. And the academics, the trigger points for the academics are saying this is the early intervention. They've just started. They're not coming to class. They've failed the first assignment. Um, they're not engaged. So they'll refer them to come and see us. So we really are seeing students almost all day, every day throughout the year. And you know, even this period before, between the exams, the results just came out. You just keep seeing lots and lots of students. This is what my life basically is about and what we are doing basically full time. This is something we do during the semester, and this is for those who are invited, who have been at, uh, show cause. They're unsatisfactory. They've failed two semesters in a row. They've failed two semesters in a row. And they've given this information from the, um, you know, from the faculty. And they're basically asked to come to this weekly meeting. I call them like AA meetings. They're just meetings, but they're not AA meetings. But we're just talking about those who are really need to talk about not what they're going through in the, each individual unit, but what they're going through as their sort of issues in terms of why they keep failing semester after semester. And I'm there to facilitate, we you know, we'll always have a, an academic who's, who's in this group, but they're basically, it's a peer support thing. And we're basically on this thing to say, look, it's over 12 weeks, come one hour a week when you don't have a, we, we run a couple of them, when you don't have a clash on your timetable, come and have this chat and we're just going to say, hang in there. And we're giving some strategies, we're giving advice. I give a lot myself in terms of what the students are saying. What's working for you? What's not working for you? What's better this semester? What wasn't so good last semester? You know, we're, we're just talking it through week in, week out, and we're trying to get this thing happening. We've been in the last three years, and it seems to be working for those who come. Again, these are Glenn's ideas. I've got it. So this is an example of the last ones I've got. So Sorry, I'm in your way. Um, so I looked at, you know, I had, what was it, um, 44 students last, last time. So um, when they, before they were at risk, short, these were their results. You can see there were 71% fails. These are students who fail basically nearly three quarters of their units. And the results, were, this is their actual results from, you know, the records. So 21, blah, blah, you can see that. And then after the 12 weeks um, that they did it, we had, you know, a really positive sort of turnaround from... 71% we got to 36% which is still very high of course, higher than it should be but it's still a big improvement for these, but the same students after the 12 weeks and you can see their pass rates and everything else have, have gone up. Now again before I was saying I was really sceptical about you know looking at evaluation forms and whatever, I'm really also going to argue now that you know, Glenn says we can't but I, I can't claim, I don't think that's the only reason why that that's why they're um, doing better. They are doing better, but I think there's a whole range of reasons. So I, I personally, I, I 
always look at these things with a bit of grain of salt, whatever. So um, this is something that I think is, is something that is working at whatever level, but look, we're going to continue with it. The fifth thing, I know I haven't got much time, is the last two years we've really started to ramp up. And these are the last three um, appointments we've made. Our new uh, ADAs are really working hard on this. The, the SPARs, they used to be called Rovers and because that's what they did. They were students who did really well in first year, second year. They got high distinctions and they were personable with good skills and whatever. And we got them to be basically the Rovers. Now they're called Swinburne Peer Assistants and they hang out for two or three hours in a central um, building in uh, next to the cafe there. And uh, from 11 o'clock, 11.30 till about 2.30, Monday to Friday for the 12 weeks of semester, they are there, well advertised. And any student can come and talk about whatever they want to talk about with these spas and to talk, you know, peer to peer about, look, I'm having a problem with this, I'm having a problem with that, this assignment, that assignment, the reading, whatever, this teacher is giving me the irritations, whatever. So they can talk about whatever they want to talk about peer to peer and that's really taken off and I'm really proud of what uh, my colleagues have been doing on that one. Again, I'm sorry if you haven't had time to read all that, but time is short. The other thing they started, again, I mean, they didn't start it, no, we've been doing it for a long time, but it really never took off the mentor, and I, I know all universities are doing this, we're doing it as well. It's the idea that again, this is now not talk, talking so much about individual units or particular problems that students have, but the mentor program is now building up. We have, you know, from a low base of 20, 30 students, we now have, you know, about 300 mentors working, sometimes two, sometimes three students for each one of them, usually first year, first semester students who ask to be mentees and to basically do what it takes, again, to be a good student, but now not hearing it from boring academics like me, but basically hearing it from a, a peer um, who is really basically someone who they, they can relate to, who did that last year or the year before that or the year before that. And that's the, the mentors. Final one, sorry, Liz, I'm going over time, um, is the study groups. Again, this was, again, my, my great colleague, Julie Gersman, who works in the business faculty, who started this off with the PASS program. The PASS program, she started in the early 2000s. It's now developed. It's gone beyond all the faculties. And what we have, again, are really good students who've got distinctions, high distinctions, got the prizes, whatever, but are also very good at communicating, who for one hour a week over the 12 weeks of semester conduct uh, a study program a study support group for one unit usually at a time. So if it's usually first year, you know, accounting, media, whatever. So they talk about this year and students enrolled in that know that this is going to be just a peer support thing. They come in in their own time. All this, of course, is voluntary. And basically the students come in and chit chat, talk about what the lectures was about this week, what the tutes were about this week, any problems they've been having with assessment, et cetera, et cetera. Again, getting it from a student point of view. Um, so that's the study group thing. Um, I know I've really rushed and I really apologise for that, but thank you.